Hello and welcome back to the Stanford Idealistic Crusade. Uh, this video is actually going to be a book review. Uh, it's one I wanted to do simply because this book is just absolutely indispensable. And uh, this is not a pre-planned thing or anything. Uh, this is not a sponsored review. It's just a book I was so impressed with that I felt the need to do a video review of it. I just really wanted to do this video because uh, for Bond fans, this this book is covering material that has really not seen the light of day before. And in fact, it, it primarily, uh, the idea of this book is to go over at least one of the most often discussed what if scenarios uh what if the timothy dalton era had continued into a third and possibly fourth film which almost did happen uh had it not been for the the legal nightmare that uh, caused the a hiatus between license to kill and goldeneye um but that's only one section of this book so uh, this this book goes much further beyond just that but i'm of course talking about mark elitz's phenomenal, essential book for Bond fans, Lost Adventures of James Bond. This is a very hefty volume. It is it is a little bit on the pricey side, but, you know, if, if you're ever looking at film books, you know they're automatically, usually on smaller, um, they're, they're printed by smaller publishers or self-published, uh, which, which this pretty much is. Uh, this is the Amazon version, which has the beautiful uh, disappearing Tim cover. You know, I, I love this cover. Uh, but if you order it from other places, it's got a uh, disappearing PPK. And that's also a great cover, but I, I really like this one. So um, if, if you want this particular cover, you'll have to get the book from Amazon. But uh, even even though this is this is about uh, you know about thirty thirty some odd dollars depending on where you get it some places have it more like thirty five um, the amount of detail the research the interviews that that uh, Edlitz compiled for this volume I mean th this this is worth its weight in gold this is catnip for Bond fans I could not put it down um, you know as you can see it is it is quite hefty but the great part is. Not only is it going into detail on the script drafts for the unmade Dalton films, um, it goes into the uh, the concept draft that uh, Richard Maybaum and uh, Michael G. Wilson put together for the original uh, prequel idea for The Living Daylights. The idea being that they wanted to do a sort of prequel bond, a young bond, probably with Dalton or, you know, whoever else had been drafted in to replace Roger post A View to a Kill. The original concept was to do a prequel film and call it The Living Daylights and see the young Bond, you know, getting getting fully formed. And then basically the, the gag is that by the end, you know, he gets sent off on the Dr. No mission. So it basically sort of goes full circle with the start of the film series. Um, so I'd always heard about that, but I, I never knew how far that got into, uh, you know, the writing stage and stuff. So that gets fully documented in here. Um, so that's just the Dalton section, but what's great about this, and I'm, I'm flipping over to the table of contents because I don't want to forget anything because this thing is quite massive. I mean, this it's not just the actual dimensions, but the amount of stuff that it goes into. Uh, it, the, the thing that really grabbed me uh, in the uh, pre-publicity materials was when uh, it was posted some of the uh, clips from the interview he did with John Landis and John Landis talking about not only the um, the contributions and his attempts at doing uh, writing on The Spy Who Loved Me. He was one of many people brought in to work on the many different versions and scripts of The Spy Who Loved Me that were ultimately not used or later on certain elements found their way into uh, other films. But then he also mentioned that he was actually asked if he wanted to direct License to Kill by Cubby Broccoli himself, and that was just a, a factoid nobody had ever brought up or dug up before. And as soon as I, I, I read that on, uh, I think it was one of the author's Facebook posts or in like the uh, Ian Fleming Foundation or something on Facebook, I read that and I was like, oh my God, like I have got to get this now. Um, so there's tons of stuff like that. But he also uh, does entire sections about the various comics of Bond, uh, not just the Dark Horse stuff of the 90s, but all these fantastic uh, Chilean comics, which are actually quite extensive and um, have their own original storylines, which I had heard of some of them, but I had never uh, realized to the extent of, of um, 
how much Bond material there was uh, in these in these foreign comics, which apparently there are some fan efforts to try and translate some of those, which is really fantastic. Um, admittedly, the one area of Bond that I'd never really gone into very much was the comic side. I have a few of the Dark Horse and uh, Dynamite comics, but uh, not not all of them. And I have, of course, uh, some of the uh, collections of the uh, British newspaper strip uh, comics. But you know, outside of that, I had never really delved into it because I only really dabble in comics. But you know, a lot of this stuff has never been collected, and uh, you have still have to track down individual issues. But also the Dark Horse stuff, there were certain storylines that were never finished. So he actually went and conducted interviews with the writers and some of the artists, and then uh, on some of those that were unfinished, he actually. Uh, published the author's original story intent. So if you ever wondered how some of these, uh, some of the Dark Horse stories uh, in these 90s comics actually finished, uh, all you have to do is, is check this book. Um, and then there is an extraordinary section on the James Bond Jr. Uh, cartoon series, which of course is usually, you, you mentioned James Bond Jr. to most of us diehard fans, and we kind of vomit in our mouth a bit. But it's amazing to see uh, talking to the creative people involved how uh, not just from their perspective but from Eon's perspective the idea was to create something intelligent and worthwhile to draw a younger audience into the world of Bond and ultimately that that kind of got watered down and changed and pulled around in the process of making it um, but it's really cool to hear from all the creative people involved, both in the early stages and the writing and then the post-production and everything, uh, just to see how it developed and what the intents were. And then he also talked to some of the people who wrote some of the uh, junior novelizations that also have some of their own original stories. Uh, and those were really interesting. And then there's even a section on the 1980s Find Your Fate uh Choose Your Own Adventure books. Uh, Find Your Fate was a series by uh, Random House by various authors, and uh, it was essentially a, uh, a riff on the Choose Your Own Adventure stories. But uh, they published them in paperback form. They did a couple licensee titles, or I should say licensed titles. So there's a couple of Indiana Jones books, which I have one or two of. And then there are several James Bond ones. And all of these are extraordinarily rare. They've never been republished. And the Bond ones were tie-ins with A View to a Kill. So they all have really beautiful uh artist painted covers and they all feature Roger Moore. Uh, I have one of them which I found by accident in a used bookshop a number of years ago. I've never found another one. They are extraordinarily rare but it's really cool to read a James Bond choose your own adventure style story with the Roger Moore Bond um, the one I have actually deals with, you know, Zorin appears and some of the other classic characters do and it deals with, uh, you know, computers of the 80s. So it's really fantastic to hear from the writers of those stories, and that is a section of Bond literature that never gets covered. So, you know, I got this expecting it to primarily be about the uh, the unmade Dalton films and the various script drafts and some other things, but, I mean, the, the level of detail gone to in here is just... Uh, I mean, the, 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 the section on James Bond Jr. alone could be published as a standalone uh, nonfiction work. I mean, that's, that's a book in and of itself, and it's fascinating. And it's really made me want to go back and finally look at that series, which I've only, you know, looked at in passing and seen the game they made and things like that. But, of course, it has no official release, so it's still very difficult to, uh, you know, try and assess properly. But I would like to actually go back now. It's, it's made me... Uh, really realize I need to reconsider that whole project instead of just, you know, like trying to sweep it under the carpet and forget it ever happened. Um, what's also interesting, he does an entire section about the uh, very similar in terms of the fans who know it usually try to ignore it, and it's very rare, um, but the uh, Adventures of 003 and a Half, the uh, children's James Bond novel that was officially licensed uh, and published under a pseudonym in the 1960s. So it's been unknown for a while who exactly wrote the book there are various fan theories and uh here he actually goes and talks to the uh most purported actual writer of the book and and his heirs and actually you know solves that case once and for all and it's an entire section that really goes into detail about even adventures of double three and a half which was only printed 
uh, in the 60s and 70s and has never been reprinted and is very rare. It's one of the few Bond works I don't have a copy of. And now I really want to redouble my efforts so I can finally read it because I, I just kind of like a lot of fans just kind of didn't really pay much attention to it and knew it was this goofy one-off that was just very, very weird. But um, it's beautiful to hear these more developed opinions from uh, people who, who actually worked on these projects or wrote them or uh, people who were in the orbit of or the heirs of the original author of these works that are not often discussed or just kind of derided or uh, you know cast aside. So this book is not just about the films. It's not just about uh, the Dalton films. It's just a, a phenomenal piece of work that is it belongs on every Bond fan's film, uh, well, I shouldn't say film shelf, but just uh, every Bond fan shelf, period, whether you're just into the films or if you go for uh, the whole experience with the literary side. But then uh, just to make sure I cover everything, you know, he talks about the um, uh, Raymond Benson stage play version of Casino Royale that was, uh, I believe, mounted only once. Uh, he talks about the uh, proposed idea for a theme park attraction for James Bond. So if you, like me, always wondered why James Bond was never uh, part of any theme park attraction, well, there were plans for it, and uh, they were almost fully realized. That's gone into here. Um, then there's even a entire section about the original proposed Never Say Never Again theme song that was originally composed and recorded before the eventual uh, Lenny Hall version was used in the film. So uh, that's a, a bit of detail that's not really got been gone into before. And uh, I mean, I didn't expect that to be in here either. That was a beautiful surprise. Uh, and then he talks to... Uh, Toby Stevens. So there's an article, a, a section where Toby Stevens talks about how he approaches playing Bond in the uh, Fleming adaptations on radio. Um, there's a giant appendix at the end that goes over various things. And this thing is also filled with some absolutely beautiful illustrations. But what I really didn't expect, and my favorite part of this, are these wonderful uh, beautifully rendered drawings that are for the various script drafts, and in particular in the Dalton section when it's going over the various drafts for the proposed third, maybe fourth Dalton film uh, that we didn't get, and uh, even the different varieties of these from different drafts, there are fully realized artist drawings and the renderings of, of Dalton are just fantastic. These are so well done that it gives you a real 100% true visualization of what's being described in text. So it really helps bring these uh, sections to life. But there's one in particular. Let me see if I can find it. I probably should have marked, <laughs> marked this beforehand. Okay, here it is. So in one of the drafts, um, you know, people always think the Dalton films are darker and things, but, you know, had... Uh, some of these versions been made, they did have lighter moments. And if you're one of those people that thought uh, Bond disguising himself in, as a clown in the circus and octopusy to defuse the bomb was a bit much, um, I believe this particular script uh, has one that goes even beyond that because it's Dalton's Bond having to disguise himself in probably what is one of the most unlikely things you could ever picture. Uh, picture Dalton's Bond um, dressed up as, and I'll just I'll just show you because it reads one way in text, but when you see the the actual artist's uh, rendering of it, of Timothy Dalton's James Bond disguised as a rodeo cowboy, <laughs> and and yes, it makes sense when you read the actual script description, um, but but yeah, there's there's a factoid for you that uh, you probably didn't expect. So uh, this this book is again just essential. I, I had um, wanted to get his previous book, uh, which is The Many Lives of James Bond, which is about uh, all the various other actors who have played the role on, you know, and, and all various media who often get overlooked instead of the, the, the main actors of the Eon film series. And so I'd heard glowing reviews about that. It is, it is a bit on the pricier side, like this book is, but um, 
it just you know had gone to my wish list of all the James Bond books I've been meaning to get and read um, because if James Bond's on the cover and it's a work of nonfiction especially uh, even if the reviews aren't very good I read it eventually because I read all of them but um, now that I've read this I've got to go and and pick that up because that book also has great reviews but I mean this one the material that's covered in here it has never been covered before and uh, you will learn so much that you did not know uh, even somebody like me who retains all this stuff in, in my head, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's hard for me to, to choose a Bond book to go with because I'm always afraid it's just going to be stuff I already know. But uh, just just go and buy a copy of this. You will read it. You will not be able to put it down and you'll be able to go back to it on your shelf uh, ever after as a real reference tome. This book is phenomenal. Um, worth every penny of the $35 price tag. Um you know, just just a fantastic work. I cannot recommend this highly enough, particularly for Dalton fans. This gives you a perfect glimpse into the uh, the inner workings at Eon and where everybody's heads were at the time, uh, especially the interviews with the writers and how they were working with Michael G. Wilson and everybody else. Um, and, you know, what Dalton's sort of inputs were, where he kind of wanted to go with certain things. Um, so it really gives you the best picture we've ever gotten of what the potential 1991 third Bond film could have been, um, you know, whichever script draft they went with to really develop, uh, you know, but it's the most detail we've ever gotten about this period. So um, that makes it alone a must, but every other section is so well put together and is filled with so much detail and care that uh, it's about aspects of the James Bond phenomenon that really haven't gotten this depth before. Uh, you know, I, I never did I think I'd read a, an entire section of a book about the 1980s Find Your Fate uh, children's paperbacks uh, tied into A View to a Kill. So um, this this book is fantastic. And I just wanted to do this this general quick review. Um, again, it's 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 quite large. It's very thick. It's it's definitely a little on the hefty side. It's a paperback, um, but it's, it's nice and sturdy. Um the, the images, the layout is very is fantastic. It's very easy to read. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty much, you know, in, in standard type font, like you were reading a, a document, but it never never gets dry. And again, the images uh, and, and the, the actual breaking up of the sections is very well done. So again, I, I couldn't put this down. So, you know, this, this thing clocks in a little bit over 400 pages and I could not put it down. I, I almost read this, and I, I mean, I practically read this in one sitting. I just couldn't stop. Um, you know, the the uh, the blurbs on the back are from you know Bruce Sively, Lee Pfeiffer, and James Chapman. You know, three you know published Bond historians. So that in and of itself, you know, when those are the three glowing tributes on the back, and it's not just uh, you know various celebrities or uh, you know the generic plot. It's you know when it's the real. Uh, you know, Bond historians, you know, it's it's definitely worth worth it for, uh, you know, diehard Bond fans. So uh, Lost Adventures of James Bond, please go and get a copy of this. You will not regret it. You'll read it a thousand times. It is a essential Bond reference work.